Hi, Kyle, and you there? Good day, Liz. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Hey. How there you doing? Go. I'm good. I'm good. The webinar is actually open. We have um, some attendees here waiting in the in, in this lobby, um, which is perfectly okay. We're gonna um, we're going to commence the webinar at eleven. Um, has Tim been able to get on? He's just here now, uh, just about to join. But I am going to be the one just sharing the video from my screen. Cool. If that's okay. Yeah, no, that will work great. So um, I'll do, so what's going to happen now is I'm going to do the introduction. I'm going to um, introduce the speakers. Then it will be Liz's turn to speak, then Ned's and then Tim's. So um, we've already tested the screen share. So as long as your computer's not too much different, it should be fine. And um, then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Okay, is there, a sh there is sound to our video. So there won't be any problems with that sound being shared? I don't think so. Okay, great. Cool, all good. Um, please make sure to turn your um, camera on if you can during your presentation. Um, and until we, be we begin, and I'll call you out, if you could just unmute your, your microphone, that'd be, sure. that'd be great too. No, no worries. worries. Thanks, Lisa.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this installation of the Wood Solutions webinar on the Bond Norwest. Uh, my name is Kyle Lowe. I'll be your host for today. I'm an engineer with the Timber Development Association and the Wood Solutions representative in NSW and the ACT. Before we begin, I'd like to do the welcome to country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and we acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship of country and forests. We pay our respect to the elders past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So before we begin, a quick little spiel about Wood Solutions. So Wood Solutions is an Australian timber industry initiative resourced by Forest and Wood Products Australia. It's for architects, engineers, designers, and other building professionals as a source of in inspiration, information, and resource resources education and CPD such as today, and um, specialised assistance on your projects. It's definitely worth having a poke through the website. It's chock full of really good up-to-date information. Um, definitely worth poking around when you get some time. In particular, the technical design guides are great resources for specific issues that you probably encounter at some point on your projects. There are over 50 technical design guides and counting. So before, just before we start, getting into the webinar, just some etiquette. So the um, chat is open to everyone. We encourage you to please have a chat, please post questions. If you know the answer to a question, feel free to jump in. Um, of course, keep it civil. Um, and if you have a question that you'd like me to ask the panelists, please let me know and um, we'll do a, we'll, we'll pose that question in a short Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if you see questions that have been asked, and, and you want to ask it, please upload it. It's a great way to get it there. Cool. Okay, so this week's presenters, we're very lucky to be joined today by three very key people of the Bond Norwest project. The first is Liz Need, the principal or a principal at Fitzpatrick and Partners Architects, Ned Sardelic, who is a construction manager at BuildCorp, and sorry, I should say Tim Spencer, head of development at Malfa. So the um, the continuing professional development points that will be issued um, is a self-assessment. So after this webinar, a certificate of attendance will be sent. Um, and then you can contact your own industry CPD provider to, to cash those in. So today, the three learning outcomes are to understand the unique challenges addressed by the, the design team, understand the bond, understand how the bond Northwest was successfully executed, and understand how the design time positioned how, sorry, how the, how the design team positioned the Bond Northwest for success. And the three CPD questions, which we posted in the chat, are number one, what drove the selection of the column grid on the Bond Northwest? Number two, what was different about on-site demands for the Bond Northwest as opposed to traditionally built structures? And three, how was the Bond Northwest massed in the structure sold to the client? Please record these for your reference, but they'll be in the chat as well. And yeah, please write your Q&A in the, in the question box. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on to Liz Need, who will take us through an architect's perspective on this project. Thanks, Keelan. Uh, and thank you for inviting us to participate in this webinar and share our journey on the bond. I uh, will just my, pleasure. my screen. So um, before I'd start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we live and work, uh, and our studio is located on Gadigal country. So my involvement in the project has been for last year, and I've been sharing the role of project architect with my colleague, Palin Chi. So the bond itself is located approximately one hour in a northwest direction from the CBD in Bella Vista. The site is located um, within a commercial precinct uh, with some healthcare facilities in close proximity. This is the bond as of last week. Uh, so it um, has been a long journey, but uh, we finally, well, Bill Court rather, reached the milestones of OC and PC. 
I included this slide. Um, I thought it would be useful to share some insights into the timeline. Um, and as I mentioned, it's been a pretty long one. So Fitzpatrick and partners were engaged um, to commence concept design in 2017. We worked through various options for the site, which was based around the concept of a hub of three buildings. Um, and this being the first of the three proposed buildings on site. After six long years, we finally reached completion. Um, and of course, Bill Corp having to endure three years of COVID, various New South Wales lockdowns and a record rainfall last year all along the way. Some basic facts about the bond structure. It's based on an 8.4 by 8.4 grid. Each typical floor plate has approximately 1,500 square metres of NLA, and there's approximately 10,500 uh, square metres of NLA overall. There's a central concrete lift core with amenities to the north side. Uh, there's three sets of fire stairs. Two sets are constructed entirely of timber and are located to the east and west ends of the site, and there's one concrete set located centrally. And the central corridor runs in an east-west direction with commercial strata suites to the north and south facades. So the building is comprised of three levels of basement car parking, a podium in concrete with six floors of mass timber construction above. The, the roof, there's plant equipment and some PV cells. And levels one to six, there's commercial office space with some class 9A use on levels one and three. Level one, there's a childcare centre, and um, there's also some further commercial space, plant and equipment. And on ground level, there is mixed use of retail and a public access lobby, uh, end of trip facilities, bike parking, courier van parking, loading bay, some general waste handling and dedicated medical waste handling. Uh, and of course, in the basement levels, there's car parking, storage space, and also an oncology treatment facility. The building has been designed with the following sectional floor to floor heights. Um, so basement 3.3 in basement level one, ground floor five metres and levels one to six, 3.7 uh, floor to floor. Uh, the timber structure, it's CLT slabs and glue land beams supplied by Binderholzer's Austria. Uh, and the thicknesses of those CLT slabs vary from 120, 140, 220 and the glue land beams are approximately, I think, 260 by 600 to 800. So our lessons that we learned during this journey were pretty much coordination, coordination, coordination. Uh, and there were some pretty key areas around that. There was coordination and the DNC process, coordination and the fire engineering report, and more specifically, performance solutions, and then coordination and exposed services. And of course, just to throw the last one in, timber in the rain. You can't control it, but, you know, what can you do about it? So coordination and the DNC process. Uh, this mass timber structure required services coordination to be finalised prior to the manufacture of the timber in order to integrate the factory, sorry, the factory cut penetrations. However, the project was executed under a DNC contract um, with a desire by the client to expedite the construction. As we all know, uh, under a DNC contract, services can change and will probably will change when the subcontractors come on board. Uh, so fundamentally, the two approaches are kind of at odds with each other. On one hand, there's a process to speed up construction, while on the other, a building methodology requiring a fully resolved design before ordering the timber. So the lesson, uh, I guess, if you can't avoid one or the other, aim for the most flexibility within the timber um, design where possible. This brings me to coordination, fire certification and performance solutions. So retrospectively, uh, there were details that had they been captured by the fire engineering report as performance solutions, it perhaps would have made life a bit easier. Uh, there were details that just didn't come to light until later in the piece. And this brings me to my next point, fire certification. Uh, proprietary fire rated systems are typically tested only for conventional structures, such as concrete. Um, however, uh, you more than likely need to obtain fire testing for projects within uh, a timber building. So when you do this, remember to include as many possible deviations 
from the main test and have them covered in the report so there's no questions about those details later on. For instance, uh, we had to have lightweight fire rated partition walls tested and certified. Um, and what that meant is that we had only had limited number of fire rated wall systems available to use. Um, and that had to apply to a, um, a variety of scenarios. For example, we needed a partition wall between office and wet areas, a pretty straightforward scenario. But the test had never included um, tiles being applied to one of the surfaces. So there are implications around interfacing the fire rated lightweight walls with the facade. And that had to be worked through because we didn't just defer, we, well, sorry, we couldn't just defer back to the um, manufacturer's installation details um, because we had timber somewhere um, in the scenario. Another example was that the risers, which were all uh, fully constructed of timber, had to be fully lined with fire rated board to meet DTS requirements since no combustible materials are permitted. But had this been explored as a performance solution, uh, it might have been avoided, or at least it wouldn't have been an unforeseen cost down the line. So remembering testing takes time and money. So if you find out later in the process that you need further testing and time is of the essence, it can cause extra headaches. So, so as atypical details arose, we had to comply with DTS, which wasn't always easy in a timber building. But of course, with a collaborative team, you can always overcome the issues. Uh, the thing, of course, about timber buildings is that they're probably the most beautiful when they are at their most basic and raw. And then we go and add stuff like facades and services, which brings me to coordination and exposed services. So this is a fairly common, obvious consideration for any building with exposed services. It's just in this case, um, there was more of a desire and an importance to show off the timber soffits. Mentioned in the first slide, we had to get this right before the timber was manufactured. But as is usually the case with DNC process, the aim is to capture any potential failure cost savings. In this case, an example of a VE item was that the linear lights to the commercial spaces, which were originally meant to be orientated in the same directions as the beams and rebated into them, uh, as a cost saving, they were rotated to reduce the overall length. This meant a successful cost saving, but from the aesthetics perspective, not so great. And when you're talking dollars, the aesthetics cards never seem to hold much weight. And finally, while trees love rain, timber does not. Protecting the timber was always an issue and one that was raised and discussed by the contractor. If it was wrapped, it risked getting damp and under the protective coating, it'd get mouldy. How if it was exposed, you get staining for weather and construction, weather, sorry, wear and tear. Sydney just so happened to have the wettest year on record in 2022 with 2,194 millimetres of rainfall. In terms of protection, the CLT slabs, um, the joints were patched with a protective strip of membrane and then eventually they had to be um, protected the entire slab um, with a membrane to assist mitigating the deluge of water that was coming through the stories of the building. However, it's worth mentioning that sometimes there are just easy fixes out there. And in this case, Bill Corp had found a domestic team, a timber cleaning product from Bunnings, I think, that removed the stains really effectively. This was a really interesting project to be involved with, even if it was a relative, relatively short one for me personally. It was really exciting to come to site to see the progress of the timber installation. It was a long process to get to this point, and it has reinforced the need and the value of strong collaboration between client, contractor and architect in taking on any bespoke construction, particularly such as mass timber. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Liz. That was really informative, um, especially like the, the lifting the lid on the coordination aspect. We hear that a lot, but um, it's it's yeah, it's great to hear it from yet another another place of um of earned experience. <laughs> All right. Um, up next we have Ned, who is the construction who is a construction manager at Build Corp. Um, so 
yeah, I'll pass on to you, Ned. Thanks, and thanks for that. And Liz, well done. That was um, really enjoyable. Thank you for that. Um, so today we'll share, share our lessons learned on building the bond and particularly about the challenges for the design team. We, before we start, though, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands which we work, live and learn and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So for a little bit about BuildCorp before we jump in, um, BuildCorp is a privately owned construction company built very much on family values. Um, people don't know much about us. We've been around for about 33 years. Um, we spend a lot of um, time and passion from Tony, Josephine and Jordan sponsoring rugby union from grassroots to the national team, particularly the Wallaroos that you might know about, um, the women's female international team under the 15s. Um, we're the best managed um, company in 2001 for Deloitte's, which we're quite proud of. Um, we've got offices. Oh, sorry. I'm Excuse not sure. me, Ned. I think I your screen. Yeah. yeah. I thought I was sharing it. I apologise. You don't want to see my face. You want to see our screens. I apologise. That's okay. Is that with you now? Uh, not, I guess it's coming on. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Cheers, Ned. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the last one, the point, the point there, so the Employee of Choice Award for five years between 2018 and 2022, and um, Tony, Josephine and Jordan are very proud of their involvement with the Bill Corp Foundation that has raised over $4 million for mental health. So before we start talking about the bond, um, we'll also, some of the lessons learned we're sharing today also learned from uh, some of our previous timber buildings, the Ainsworth uh, Building at Macquarie University, um, the Barker College Mass Hub, which we're just finishing at the moment. Dave Strahl and his team out there are finishing that in the next couple of months. Um, 44 Martin Place for our first timber commercial building and the UK um, refectory up in Brisbane, which was one of our first timber buildings. So when we got asked to share our lessons learned, we sort of jumped at the opportunity because creative, creative learning and, um, and sharing our experience is very much a core value for BuildCorp. So the photo here, you can see we actually um, showed around some students from Loretto um, to sort of show the timber experience and trying to get um, young females to learn more about engineering in the building industry, which has been great. So the first lessons learned and very much continue on with what Liz was saying about the design needs of the early coordination we wanted to talk about the supply chain design and construct process and how it differs from more traditional construct only all the way through to mass timber. So the first bar at the top there, you can see the traditional construct only projects, very much the client and the designers resolve the problems, the solutions, find out what needs to be built and hand it over to the builders and subcontractors to build. Through DNC, more traditionally, the builders get involved, which can work really well. In a peer review design and construct, we quite often get subcontractors to help and help sort of share that some of that expertise around. But with timber construction and mass timber design and construct, we've found that really it's absolutely key and a key lesson learned is to get the whole supply chain involved in working on the best solution. So at the bond, we had some great advice and some experience from Safcon, one of our subcontractors who do a lot of our timber install, Binderhouse, as Liz mentioned, from Austria and also the logistic companies to really try and figure out the best way to get the material to site to ensure that we get the design needs that Malfa and Fitzpatrick were after on the project. We found, and Liz was bang on, it's coordination, coordination, coordination. Um, very much the design effort seems to be almost reversed to what you'd expect in a more traditional building. Typically, you do the design as you build and you always have a number of steps ahead of it. This is bang on. You had to coordinate everything at the very beginning so you can ensure that the timber that was being fabricated had covered as many aspects of the project as possible. So you we were looking at flexibility of design, talking about services coordination in the DNC market, which, as Liz said, can cough and change. So we found it's the same effort of design, just at a quite a reverse profile of the time. You need to make sure that it is a really big design team all the way through from all the consultants, the fire engineering, the BCA, the subcontractors, working on the solutions early so we can start actually fabricating the timber as soon as possible. And then we come back through in this continuation of design finalization on the other elements other than the timber, because quite often these timber buildings, they're not just the timber elements we need to resolve. 
Well, another key element is the sharing of the drivers for timber. And we were quite lucky with um, Tim and the Mulford team. We understood the driver for the timber was very much about the appearance and the wellness. So we, it helps if the, the construction team and our subcontractors understand some of the drivers. But it's quite difficult to get conflicting views all at the same time. So it is possible to do an incredibly high quality project with a very fast program at a low cost. But not really. Um, so you can do the um, you can do them all, but just not on the same project. Very much a key le lesson learned there is determine the driver of what's important and ensure that the client gets what they want. And I agree with Liz's comment before that the timber looks its best when it's at its most raw. Um, and then I think this is a great photo of what is an amazing looking structure. But it's important to note that the structure it's not it's not an element. It is a timber structure so this photo here i think shows really well the coordination that the design team needs to go through you see the coordination for the future services the penetrations you can see the on the, on the just to the left there the um the circular core hole for the fire services as well as the mechanical penetrations you've got a hole there um, just under the timber beam where we will need to fire rate for the connection details there's a chip in the timber that obviously needs to get pet patched because it is a timber structure and when it gets bumped, it will get, it will dent or scratch or break. Um, and you've got a nice square there, which is made from the sun bleaching, all that needs to be repaired before we finish the get the finished product. And you might be able to see there on the left-hand side, Liz's comment about the water staining, the underside of the surfeit and the junction to the um, beam, there's a bit of um, the water staining coming through. So even with the the patching and even with the membrane, you still get some water with an exposed feed. So it's important to understand that what's the expectations of the finished product? How is the design coordination going to ensure that we have flexibility in the future to put our services in, but we still need to get that design requirement that we're after. So it is a timber structure, not a piece of joinery. And to me, this is really one of the big lessons learned we probably need to take from the Europeans and apply to Australia. Um, this is a photo that we took of the timber um, manufacturing yard in the Binder House in Austria a number of years ago. That They've been doing timber structures for a lot longer than we have, and they understand that is a timber structure. It is not a joinery piece. So the elements of the structure need to be exposed. They need to be done, but they're there to do a purpose. So we need to understand what the intent is for the exposed finishes. And to get that right, we believe a key lesson learned is getting the whole team to embrace technology. The design coordination takes time and it has to be done, as Liz mentioned, very, very early. You need to try and resolve as many of the design issues you can to ensure that the shop drawings and the fabrication process you can see on the top right includes the services we need. We were talking about the supply chain. The logistics coordination is absolutely key if you're going to be using big blue land members from um, Europe. How do we get the timber here in the most efficient way possible on time to ensure that it meets our program? which is where the delivery coordination comes in. If the whole team works together to embrace technology, we can do that with a lot more efficiency to ensure that the model is really ensures that we build it, get the model as right as we can so you can build it as fast as you can. And this next slide, hopefully you can see the progression. The model was quite accurate, very accurate at the bond, and you can see that the structure is following it. Get the details right early, fabricate it properly, and we can build it for you nice and quickly. And then probably another key lesson learned is for us, because the timber's fabri fabricated, because generally it's sitting there on the docks or on the, um, on the site ready to go up, you're applying lessons learned not necessarily on the next lesson, but on the next project. So you need to ensure that you go back to first principles on every project and ensure that you foresee the problems that may come up, resolve them as soon as you can, and ensure that you record and share the lessons learned for the next one so that we all, I think we all want to, everyone who's worked in a timber building wants to build another one because it's a great experience. You walk away with a lot of pride and satisfaction, but we need to make sure we share the lessons learned. And that's really where the experience comes in, where the more of these you do, the better you get, the faster we get, and the better outcome we'll get. Um, I always thought rather than sort of talking about the timber, we'll just sort of show a few photos of the site as we're progressing. I'll do this quite quickly. Um, this is a photo of the basement. Um, Liz mentioned a couple of levels of basement down below, um, and particularly on the left-hand side of the photo there, the northern side of the site, the space where the um, bunker was built for the Genesis fit out. This is a photo of the ground floor of access down to the ramp at the back. Um, we've started putting the timber up to sort of see, to ensure that all the stakeholders understood how it was going to look and some of, the, some of the quality management details we could do quite early in the piece before we poured the ground floor slab. 
So the photo of the timber stairs that Liz was mentioning, there's two timber stores either side, timber stairs, sorry, either side of the building. A nice photo of the structure that we're getting. We nearly finished the structure at that stage. Great photo of some of the detailing with the diagonal bracing on the fire stairs. You can see the braces here, even these little square panels, you can see at the um, top of the legs there, that's a, but the, obviously you need them to hold the timber up, but you can see that patch I showed before about the sun bleaching. It doesn't take long to get that yellow staining on the timber, which is really important to consider when we look at the finished product. Exposed services look great, trying to keep the timber as raw as possible. Great, it's a nice simple photo of the facade putting going in. Oz Rice did the glass for us up there and I think the facade looks really good. If it finishes off the Fitzpatrick design really well. And this slide here just shows the progression of the timber. Um, though we had a lot of problems with it, weather um, it was pretty wet, as Liz mentioned, the actual timber program went pretty well. And you can see that within about three months from June to September, we finished off the structure and had most of the glass on pretty quickly. So when you get in the flow, timber can really fly. So going away from the design lessons learned, we also wanted to touch on some of the comparisons between two quite different but quite similar projects. Um, obviously the bond to the left, we chose to compare that to the George Centre, um, 10,000 square metre hospital of 78 paediatric and maternity, hosp maternity hospital beds. And the key issue here or the key lesson learned was the change in um, the staff movements. You can see on the left that the people on site continue to build, but at the George more conventional concrete frame structure, we had the more traditional bell curve. That might look interesting, but when you compare that to the Ainsworth building, it's not, it's not a freak, it's not a change, it's a trend. The, the labour force seems to build, and predominantly that's because the timber structure needs less people on site. With all the coordination you do early, the timber can go really quickly with a smaller team on site, which is great. Less people generally means less noise, less disruption to the local environment, less vibration, less dust, less people on site is safer. Through the Bond, the Ainsworth, Barker and our other timber projects, we're yet to have, hopefully touch wood, pardon the pun, we, will try not, we haven't had a lost time injury on any of our timber structures yet. So the less people on site makes it safer, less disruption to the environment, which is great. As well as learning, talking about our lessons learned, we'd also sure would share some sneak peeks. So hopefully these videos work. Quick little quick video of outside walking up towards ground floor there. Beautiful, give you some videos of the exposed structure coming through the glass, which looks great. This is inside with our project manager, Perry Riggy and his team had built it, being our tour guide, <laughs> sort of showing the finished structure out there with egg coming very open through the fit out, which is great. And the last video is one of the more open spaces. We've just talked about the coordination of the services, keeping the timber and the structure quite raw. And I agree with the comment that looks beautiful. So I hope that it, this has been informative to you. If you've got any questions, please ask us later on. And um, I guess we'll leave it now for you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Ned. That was really, I, I, I really enjoyed that. I especially liked your points on the, um, on the particulars of the feedback um, on these projects that it comes at the next project, not, not the next level. And the it's particularly excellent to hear that you've not had a single lost time injury. That's very impressive and speaks volumes about your your team. Um, so last, last but not least, from the design team of uh, the project team, we have Tim Spencer from Alpha. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass on to you, Lisa. Thanks. I'll just um, play the video first. Of course. Cool. Yeah, we can see it. I'm just hoping you'll be able to hear it as well. Uh, no, Lisa, the um, audio is not coming through. It's not coming through? No. Um, could you change your microphone? Um, if, if Are you wearing a headset? I'm not, no. Oh, okay. Um, 
Can you try setting the video to play through your computer's speakers? Sure, just one moment. Well, it is, so. um, I'll try that again. Is that, sorry, is that working? Please. Hello. Oh, sorry, Lisa, no, um, no, it's not working. No, so, no uh, sound? No sound. That's right, um, this scared me. Give me, um, give me a moment. I'll try downloading it, and we'll, um, I'll let you know when it's done. It should be done in a in a minute or. Actually, if you if we just pause for thirty seconds, um, uh, it looks like I'll be able to get this up for you. Okay. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. All right, let me know if you can't hear this. No, I can't hear that either. Give me one second. We'll get there. Let's try this. Journey now for quite some time, probably dating back. Yeah, to that's working. Uh, cool. where we, for us, we've been on a journey now for quite some time, probably dating back to around 2014, uh, where we want to leave a legacy, and that has to be based in wellness and education um, and connection of community. The bond is built out of timber. We started exploring uh, timber structures back in, uh, again, around 2014 as the start of that kind of consideration into well buildings and the health of its occupants. Our first project uh, in timber was a retirement village, vertical retirement village in 2015. Uh, it was ahead of its time. Uh, the Bond is our first commercial construction building, and I like to think it's our third evolution in terms of wellness buildings. The Bond really hit a sweet spot. Um, of a beautifully designed building close to home. It's a very kind of medical and health-centred uh, environment. We're looking to extend that even further and harder into stage two. And it fits perfectly with Norwest Private Hospital across the road. Beautiful, thank you for that. Uh, Colin, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, I think my my um, my commentary on the building is is probably from a little bit of a, a different perspective. And I think the questions that I was asked were kind of um, how did Malfa's thinking lead to a timber building? And uh, I spoke to that a little bit in that video in regards to, I guess, um, we did start the process about considering timber back in 2014. But if we're really completely bare truth honest, um, it probably came from a time cost perspective in the first instance. Um, it was probably a, um, a consideration of deteriorating quality of trades on site um, uh, and the need to try and reduce time on site um, and, and hence increase our, our quality, but try and get that time saving in there um, to save money. Um, uh, you know, on our first project, there was there was a consideration around the psychological health of, of the look and feel of, of timber. Um, but it was really interestingly, the board uh, approved the construction in timber um, only if we covered it up 
so you couldn't see it. So from the board's point of view, for the clientele of um, of retirement, um, uh, the psychological wellness side of it was not considered. It was more put under the table of that time, cost, and quality. Now, really interestingly, um, you know, I think it's we've heard from the team today. Um, it is a different design methodology that you have to go through with timber. And, you know, I think whilst you might save a little bit of time once you hit site, you're doing a hell of a lot more time upfront in that design coordination. So, you know, do you have overall um, time advantage? There's a question mark there um, in, in my head. Um, our journey, uh, I guess, has evolved kind of with everyone's kind of since that, that early 2014 time. You know where I guess the importance of 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 health and that psychological proposition turned into more acknowledgement about around holistic wellness, um, and then the next step has been really kind of the focusing in on sustainability from a from a renewable source um, uh, was probably in the in the in the brain, and then latest kind of thoughts um, is really embedded carbon. So I, I guess I'm being honest when I say. Yeah, you know, when I look at time, cost, health, sustainability, and then embedded carbon, but those four thoughts weren't all, you know, conscious back in 2014. There's been a real evolution of, of I guess, the benefits of of timber. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, the difficulty about uh, trying to design a, a flexible building um, out of timber, you know, something where you're not exactly sure. Uh, who the end user is, um, uh, Tim is really difficult because of the uh, the need to for that design coordination that Liz and Ned spoke to, um, uh, and so for me, you know, getting the brief right really early in regards to what you are building it for um, um, is critical when it comes to timber. You know, we have a lot of um, uh, in-house debates around whether we do a um, a speculative commercial tower in timber uh, again. Um, uh, break that down even further into a services heavy um, uh, end user like medical. Um, you know, does medical suit a timber building? Um, I think it does from a psychological point of view and the holistic wellness point of view, um, but from a from a day to day point of view and the servicing heavy servicing of some of those um, tenants. I think I'm glad to be on the client side of the table and leaving the coordination and the design difficulties uh, to the team. Um, um, for me, um, the other challenge is, and, and, and Liz touched on this, um, and I think Ned, you did as well. The other challenge is, is for us is how do you keep, I guess, the supply chain and design teams competitive um, um, throughout the process, when you when you're kind of almost dragging everything all the way up front, which you know we've seen, we saw in Lisa's slide that you know if it's, we started this journey with Fitzpatrick's, quite a clear brief about timber. We're doing timber. Stop talking to me about other stuff. We're doing timber. So let's get on with it. Back in 2017, yes, COVID impacted, but you know it was delivered six years later um, in 2023. Um, you know, it's really important that we've got to maintain um, um, competitiveness throughout that whole process. And so really difficult to lock it all in nice and early. I know Ned would love to have had the contract nice and early up front, but, you know, to be honest, um, somehow we've got to maintain that, that competitiveness through the, through the process. Because in fairness, like, you know, probably Ned was pretty lucky that he didn't sign a contract in 2017 in regards to where escalation went. So, you know, there's been some um, some challenges there. Um, for me, kind of the next question that was asked was um, how the design and investment industry can make it easier for timber. Um, just a couple of points on there. Um, I, I noted ensuring the brief for timber is, is right for the product. Um, uh, again, our retirement village project um, in 2014, um, it was around a building. So I'd, I'd recommend that you don't try and build a round building um, out of timber. Um, so that was interesting. Um, uh, the regulatory overlays, uh, you know, Liz touched really heavily on that. 
Um, we've definitely been through the um, through the ringer on that, not just in regards to how timber itself is modelled and the methodology of modelling um, its fire compliance, but then subsequently um, all the testing of the of the supporting um, products and certifications. Um, you know that's um, that's been a bit of a big journey for us. Um, and then, um, but you know, I think where the world's moving forward and better embracement of you know the holistic ESG balance sheet valuation and, and equation, timber should come into um, um, I guess better assessment um, through that process, which which I think is good. And you know, as you know, for me, mulfa has got to um, zero carbon living in our residential product. Um, you know, our next frontier is. Um, has to be the embedded carbon, the circular economy, waste minimisation. Um, you know, tem I think timber and let's call it um, detailed and, and technical design up front, which can, I believe is a really efficient way to limit waste, um, has to play a major part in the future, I believe. That's enough for me, I think. Go to questions. Beautiful. Thanks for that, Tim. Really appreciate that. Um, uh yeah so um we've we've heard from a range of the design team now if, i'd like to invite all three of our panelists to to shut their faces and turn on their mics for the end part we'll go through some um some questions if you're in the audience we have almost 100 people here attending um please please pop in your questions if you have them um i've got a few so i'll go, I'll go first um just on your presentation tim you mentioned the 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 well, first of all, the layering of benefits from 2014, which is an interesting time because that was about the beginning of several people's uh, interest in timber in Australia. Um, I'm speaking specifically about Lendlease here when they started Forte, et cetera, back in that era. So it's interesting that that a lot of attention was being pushed toward that way. And since then, we've had a layering of the benefits of not just weight and time in like specific scenarios, like universities have to get there quickly or buildings that have to be lightweight for one reason or another, but layering on the health sustainability, the carbon storage. The labour is really interesting. You mentioned a deterioration of trades. Can you speak a bit more about that? Ned probably can speak to the declining quality of our trades and quantity of our trades in Australia best, but, you know, I think it's um, it's been something that the industry has been very aware of for a while. Yeah, I think, um, and, and Tim's right, um, Kylan. So I think, um, you know, with the fact that when you do something like a prefabricated timber structure like we've done there at the Bond, we had, I was speaking to Perry, um, the project manager out there, just recently, relatively recently, he was staggered by the small number of trades that we needed on site to actually build a timber project. I think we had something like, and um, I should probably, probably apologise to Perry if I get this number wrong, but it was something like in the vicinity of 30 of um, you know people on site putting the timber up where it would have been hundreds if it was formworks, concrete or steel fixes. Um, and when you're going through, you know, like some things now where people get sick and there's COVID and the shutdowns and all the rest of it, having a, a group of people that can do something pretty easily um, to a high quality like this, it's, it's just easier. So I think Tim makes a really good point. And I, I agree with him. Mm, that's one thing that, that that gets extolled a lot is that you only need a handful of handful of people to really put these things together. Um, yeah, there's a lot of talk through through all the presentations about, about, about the um, services coordination I, I particularly enjoyed your video, Ned, where it, it, it reveals the final um, use of the checkouts next to the columns, where those uh, data cables or um, other services were running. Um, the you guys obviously really respect the the discipline that's required up front to get these things forward. Did that come from one spot, or did did all three of you, from your past experience? unilaterally pull that together at the beginning? I'm not sure which one of the three of us want to go. So <laughs> but, um, um, I, I, you know, do you want to go start with Liz? Or? Yeah, look, I, I wasn't involved at that stage, but I guess I, I can talk to the point that having to do it later in the stage um, where it, it wasn't always picked up because that was our experience that, you know, it, it just 
you know, there were things always that we had to go back and coordinate. And obviously you, you can't go and, I mean, there were penos that you could put into the, the timber structure um, after it had been erected on site, but it was it was really tricky. It, it really was. And I think I honestly don't know how you could capture all of those changes early on because it, it required 100% you know, services coordination. Um, and yeah, I don't know, a building that actually gets to that point. But yeah, it's just a myth in the Australian construction landscape, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think? I, I think it's I think it's really difficult from, you know, our industry is kind of um, uh, set up that traditional chart we saw Ned put on the table, but it's, you know, somehow you've got to take a client's brief. Um, which, which, you know, needs the maximum amount of flexibility it can ever get um, in it in order to try and ensure, I guess, financial resilience and the ability to mould to a market. Like one challenge we've got, especially in New South Wales, is the longevity of projects, which means, you know, I'm having a, 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 a brainwave, which I think is bloody brilliant, back in 2015-16, right, and, and by the time we get to 2023, you know, that brainwave is outdated and, and not really a brainwave, like a ripple. And, and <laughs> you know, and, and the building itself needs to adapt to the market. So kind of from the light bulb moment through to, um, I guess, the conceptual design and then the practical overlay of, you know, that's the supply chain themselves, you know, um, I'm gobsmacked about, I guess, I'm not gobsmacked at all, actually. It makes complete sense that I can have a full suite of designers, service designers, and their design goes to market and gets priced and tested um, and, and peer reviewed. Um, and we end up with something quite different in reality through the supply chain um, overlay. Right. And then I've got tenants that I've, that I've, didn't even know existed back with the first brainwave come in and say, hey, by the way, I want to put a, um, what do you call that, linear rotator MRI machine on a floor or, or you know, I need 6,000 bolts of juice or, you know, and I don't know that back then either. So it's kind of like it is difficult. Most buildings manage flexibility pretty um a bit more easily. Timber is not flexible. Mm. Like in, in an I beam, it's a hell of a lot easier to cut a hole in the web and just throw, mm. whack it through, right? Timber is a hell of a lot more engineered. And I think mm. that's got to continue along what you were saying before, too, Tim. It's the flexibility when, when you have those brain ripples and you try and get to site, and everyone has best endeavors to try and factor in future spaces and requirements. But as you say, yeah, try and do something like this, which is a great idea with no real fixed tenants. You're trying to ensure that you, you know, X amount of years ago, you got the right provision for someone that might come up in one day. It's quite difficult. So and, I think and, you really need to go back to the first principles and try and just do your best and give the endeavours, Kyle, and then try and go from there, really. It's all you can do because you're never going to get it right. We just need to try and build in that flexibility as right as you can. And, and I think the Bond team as a whole, from my perspective, has done that really, really well. Like, And, really and well. ultimately it yeah. goes, I think it really enforces the importance of your design manager and 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 that person being absolute top notch. Mm -hmm. And um, whether that's your, your lead architect or um, for our in our purposes, it was through Build Corp. Um, you know, it was it was managed really really well. well you talk about um, making things uh, like making things simple or or allowing room for flexibility, but you didn't make things easy for yourselves in some regards. Like I've gone through those videos and 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 um, images, like really interesting de um, details that were glossed over. Uh, the the interstory bracing is is impressive. And likewise with the stair, the, how you hang hung the um the stair landings. Like that, that's that's really cool. Can you talk me through the stair landings, Liz? I can't really because I wasn't oh, okay. involved in the structural design of, of that part. I would love to. Um, but, yeah, look, the fire stairs, 
um, are pretty amazing. Like to, to think you can have a, a timber fire stair and obviously there's sprinklers and everything that makes them possible. But um, yeah, structurally we would need TTW to uh, <laughs> come on board to give us a bit more um, input on that. They were invited on this webinar, but we try and keep the panelists down to three and we get a lot of structural engineers. So that's why we, um, we turf them this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, TTW. Um, well, Ned, could you talk about the assembly of either the, the interstory diagonals or the stair landings? Yeah, no, um, they were difficult and our team um, sort of worked really well to sort of put them together. Um, you know, the way we were sort of envisaged and putting together a time attender and, um, you know, with, with temperature, we were looking at, do you try and piece it together as a unit and put it up? And it was a great idea. And I think we spent a fair bit of time in the tender presentation, Tim, going through a, a wonderful ideas of how we're going to do that, which, of course, didn't work. And the guys found a better solution on site. But um, because the beams, uh, because of the diagonal span across a number of floors, you know, how to get them in and out and around was quite difficult. So um, the team... You know, Without wanting to underplay it, and it's probably should leave um, either Perry or um, Thomas, our team out there, to sort of go through the details. Um, the good thing about it, it was coordinated so well. So when it went together, it all fit pretty well. And Binder House did a pretty good, um, really good job sort of making sure that everything was built to the shop drawings. The coordination was right. Um, the detailing and the finalisation of the fixings worked really well. So it was actually quite a, it's a very efficient structure. TTW did a great job mm -hmm. and then Binder House sort of worked with them to get down to it. When you look at the um, the spacing of the beams and the size of the members and even the weight of the fixings, it was a very efficient design that without wanting to downplay it, it sort of just went together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Um, so it worked it worked really well. And I think that when you look at, you know, the building looks great and I'm looking at, there's another slide of the screen there I can see it in there. It's um, having the class that's so clear and seeing the structure and and sticking with something like that there, I think, you know, Malfa needs to be, you know, congratulated on that because it could have easily been done a different way, um, made a bit cheaper, but it looks fantastic. And when you drive past on the street, it looks brilliant. So I thought it was a really good design. Yeah, straight appeal. Mm. On that note, um, all the timber was fabricated offshore, correct? Yep. It was Binderholz on the GLT. Who was on the CLT? Uh, Binderholz worked on both. They did the glue lamb and the CLT. Both. Ah, that would have made things um, somewhat easier. Did they? Did did both those elements come from the same the same um, factory? Uh, there's different factories that focus mm. on different elements of it, um, but uh, that. They're, all their timber came from in and around the Austria area. They do have a number of different forestries around Europe, but um, the timber came from a similar area. Um, and the two plants um, that do the glue lamb and the CLT are relatively close to within a, you know, relatively close driving distance between the two, but they mm. are different factories. Um, but their system, their, their shop drawings, their logistics, the way they coordinate everything, which is uh, sort of run out of their sort of head office, um, works really well. And, um, you know, we have done CLT from Australia before and that works well too, but in this particular project, the combination worked well and, and Binder House did a really good job. Mm, mm, interesting. Thanks for elaborating on that. Um, on, on that coordination side, you mentioned that you went to a degree of effort to 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 build that that diagonal as a frame and it ended up being done, um, well, you know, it's the rubber hits the road when you're there with a hammer and a drill thinking, okay, <laughs> how do we do this? Um, how was the... And, um, how is the coordination achieved? So um, the big question for me is how much were you able to use 3D information to approve model sets? Uh, it's a, a lot. Um, so there was a bit of combination of both the 3D and the digital um, modeling and the approval as well as the um, old school paper version. Um, particularly though with the diagonal, a lot of the 3Ds worked as, helped us work the coordination of the methodology on how it was going to work and then how we're actually going to get the elements, you know, put into a, a container and shipped over. So that a lot of it was done digitally. Um, it was a bit challenging early because of the way that the engineering in Europe's done is slightly different. Um, I think they um, they get a bit frustrated sometimes about some of the way the processes we have to do for our certification and our final, because they've been doing it for so long. You talk about some of the fire test things and they just, you know, look, they just don't understand, but it's like, um, and they don't understand because they've done it so often. It's not as if they, they don't understand the importance of it. They just think that they you know, some of the paperwork's a bit over the top and that's just not been, that's a number of people I've spoken to in Europe. Um, but yeah, the digital work worked well. Um, they did a really good job sort of finalising some of the details with TTW. Um, but to answer your question succinctly, a lot of it was done in, via the model and digitally, but there was still some paperwork too, yeah. 
Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I, I really do believe that as the future is more people get on to, you, you just can't design these things in three dimensions. It just doesn't work. No, no, no. Um, yeah. Um, you touched a bit, a question that's come up is is a, a broad question, but I think it's an important question is, hey, but they've done this in Europe for decades. Why can't we do it in Australia? <laughs> and you mentioned about the, the regulatory load being especially high here. Um, fire being the obvious culprit, um, and that landscape is is persisting in its difficulty, especially in Victoria. Um, apart from fire, are there any other big ones that you see holding us back? I think resolution of the earthquake code is um, a bit a bit tricky. Um, so um, another project where we had the footprint was about half the size of the bond, but we've got effectively, you know, um, you know, double the weight of the fixings, predominantly for the earthquake code. So that that's problematic. Um, I think it needs to be done. I think there is a bit of a perception of acoustics um, as well as the, the, the um, fire in the um, earthquake codes, which needs to be dealt with. Um, but I think I'm probably on the builder here, so I should probably pass over the to Tim or, Tim or Liz to see if they want to talk about some of the um, their, their concerns with the certification. Yeah, I, I think it, as I sort of um, talked about in in my um, talk, it, it really was just using the proprietary products and then putting them in a timber building. I mean, Australia is not geared up to it, um, as the question um, refers to, but I think it's all the the follow-on elements that go around the timber building. It's um, and yeah, it, it's just having a bit more, you know, certification in place and ready for a timber building would be really helpful. And not having to do everything yourself and and go and get it, you know, fire tested. Um, and then, as I said, you know, you you go and get the test and you get it done for, you know, you'd have a, a timber portal with the the fire rated wall system in it. But then, of course not every scenario on site is going to be exactly like that. So, um, and you get that done so early on in the piece and then you, you know, you get to site and then there's, you know, 10 different, you know, situations where you have to apply that um, system. So, and you can't go back and get it retested. So mm. I think that that would really help once it becomes um, a bit more um, commonplace in Australia. And that's the experience that we found, especially in the first building that we built, the retirement building um, back in 2015, was was the biggest challenge um, was really that, uh, as Liz was saying, the proprietary uh, fire collars and, and penetration matters that where we didn't, you know, those, we, we may have had the panel and the panel was fire engineered, but then it's the penetrations through the panel that needed these the collars and all that type of stuff that hadn't been tested to Australian standards. So you know that yep, absolutely tested in Europe and to to European standards, but we've got our own standards. And just the fact that all of those scenarios hadn't hadn't been physically tested and rated. And and I know back in 2014, Len Lease was doing a lot of testing. We were fighting for for CSIRO um, uh, time and space. Len Lease wasn't releasing their test results. Right, which was pretty disappointing from an industry point of view. Um, whilst we ended up, we released ours once we got them. So, but I think as the years are going by, more and more products are being tested. The products themselves are going and getting themselves tested. You know, it's it's more coming up to speed. Yeah, we're starting to just see the fruits of that compounding ten years later. Yeah, and the story that I'm. That, that I'm hearing resoundingly is that that compounding is beginning to pick up some serious pace. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what yeah. are you guys looking for in your next next timber buildings? Just to close us out. You first. Right? Yeah, first. <laughs> I always think you start with the developer and we'll work our way down to the building. Probably the easiest team. So um, <laughs> uh, look, it really is interesting. I I, I think. Um, um, ensuring that we're doing timber for the right reasons for the right in the you know timber's got a use and i and i think it's it's the type of product that you need to be even more diligent on to ensure that it's the right material to use for your product that you want to deliver or your building that you want to deliver i think you know um i've done a retirement building i've done a pretty heavily mechanic um, medical building you know i I don't know if I'm just getting old, but you know, I'd probably steer away from those types of buildings if I was 
if I was to use timber again. Um, straight up commercial, um, absolutely. Um, but I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to say I wouldn't use it in that in that in those typologies because I love timber and I, and I think timber's definitely got a, a place to play in in the future in ESG. So, you know, for me, um, I'd probably just look to to see how that we can learn from the coordination requirements and the upfront side of things to to better coordinate the ability for flexibility in the buildings. I think for us, uh, it's really captured our imagination and, you know, obviously it's not imagination, but it's it's made us a lot gamer. Um, and we've got quite a few projects that are in the pipeline um, with uh, CLT mass timber construction. So it's really applying everything that we've been learning and we're getting better at it every time. Um, but yeah, um, and we're, we're using it in houses. Um, we've got a multi-residential um, over in Perth that we're, we're looking at using it and um, yeah, that there's there's also yeah Sydney Olympic Park. We've got um, a commercial building that uh, hopefully we'll get the the go ahead to, but that will also be um, an exciting timber bro project. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting stuff in the future. And I guess from our side, um, we we've got a couple of teams now that have worked on timber. And um, if you'd ask them when they were in the throes of the detailing, which is quite detailed, I don't know if all of them would have loved timber so much. And um, so, um, but now that they're finished and they can see the final product and they see the benefit of that hard work in the detailing coming through through the construction, you know, we've got a couple of teams that are keen to work on it again. Um, I think for what I would want in the next one is um, similar to what we had out here. It's a, it's a team that um, were clear on their objective and they shared that and we got to work with them in delivering it. That's probably a key element for us. We really want to understand what that is and work with people that are, you know, pulling in the same direction. Um, but completely, completely selfishly, what we'd like in the next timber building is a clear run without COVID and too much rain. That would be really nice and um, the rest of it will fall into place, I think. So. I think that's a fair ask. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Just to close out, I will um, just share my screen up once more and um, just to extol benefits of, and then perhaps you guys want to enter this building into the Timber Design Awards 2023. So last year, it was a great year for the Timber Design Awards. We had some excellent projects and H&E won for their waterfront tab and down in, down in Wollongong. The, um, this year's awards are opening imminently. Uh, next month, on the 9th of May, we have a Resilient Timber Homes webinar presented by um, Alastair Woodard down in Melbourne, and it's going to be featuring Paolo Lavici on how to build resilient timber homes. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you to our panellists. Thank you to our attendees, and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thanks. Ciao. Thank Cheers, you. Bye.